Well, good morning again, everyone. My name is Greg Kowser. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, it's good to see each of you this morning. Uh, it's nice to be in a warm building on a day like today. Um, uh, we had a wonderful fall uh, that we enjoyed, uh, and it seemed like uh, fall decided just to quit on one day and winter to start the next day uh, with little or no uh, uh, transition in between. Uh, got progressively colder, uh, and so I hope you're staying warm, uh, but so grateful uh, for God's provision uh, in, in and around the seasons of life as things change. Uh, thankfully, God doesn't. Uh, and his promises don't change. And we're going to talk about his promises today. Now, we're in the middle of a uh, series uh, on the book of Romans. And we're going to be saying in the middle of a series on the book of Romans for quite a while. Uh, if you are familiar with the book of Romans, it's a, a pretty uh, lengthy book for Paul. Uh, not the lengthiest book by any means. Uh, it would be a different thing if I was saying we were in the middle of a verse-by-verse verse treatment of the book of Isaiah, then we might be for a little bit longer. Uh, but uh, we're going to be in the book of Romans for a long time, and this creates a, uh, a little bit of a dynamic that I want to explain to you a little bit. Uh, and one of those is that uh, the book of Romans, and Paul, in, in, uh, in the normal way in which he approaches things, he has a very extended argument that he's making over a number of chapters. And uh, when, we ca when we move our way forward, uh, one of the things that we keep trying to do is we keep trying to bring you up to where we are. Uh, and that's a little bit uh, of a different thing. Sometimes you'll have uh, people who speak and they'll pick out a passage and then you drop right into the passage uh, and you don't deal with the lay of the land around it. But one of the things that, that we have to do in the book of Romans is when we're in any given passage, you need to know uh, where we've come from to be able to appreciate what, what's going on. And that, that is particularly the case here this morning in the passage that I have. Uh, the passage that we're going to be talking about is Romans chapter 4, right? And people who know me think, you know, Greg, how are you going to get through a whole chapter? Well, I did it in chapter 2, even into chapter 3, so I have some hope, right, of being able to do that. Uh, but there's a lot of things to say here. But my goal this morning is I prayed uh, for myself and I prayed together with Rana as we were driving in that I would bring clarity to the nature of Paul's argument. But even more so, uh, one of the things that's happening here as we're reading the book of Romans is we're being drawn back into a true account of the way things are. A true account of what really matters. You know, we live in a moment, right, where people are going to be appealing to us over the next couple weeks, right? They're, they've been appealing to us for uh, the whole of our lives uh, that there are things that we need to buy that are essential for somebody's happiness, right? Whether it's our happiness or the person that we want to buy it for, but we want to get the right gift because it's essential for their happiness. And I, I don't disagree that we can bless people with gifts, but it detract, distracts us often from the idea that true, genuine joy, true, genuine happiness can't be purchased at any store. You can't buy it anywhere. You can't pay enough money for it. Uh, matter of fact, uh, one of the things that we're going to find out is the thing that you desperately need to bring joy and fulfillment to you is something that you have to put your hands down, get down on your knees, give up, Stop trying to fix your life and ask God to do something for you you can't do for yourself. And so we're going to be busy in a, in a season of giving, which is also underlying that saying that the joy and happiness that you long for is somehow going to come to you in one of these gifts. And it'll cause many people to go into debt. It'll cause many people to feel frustrated. Uh, there'll be a lot of people disappointed because they won't get the right gift uh, all those things will happen here. But we need to be drawn back into the story of really who God is, who we are, what really matters. And that's what we're doing in the course of looking at Scripture, being brought back into the reality of the things that really matter. Uh, our joy and happiness doesn't, doesn't hinge on our, our relatives behaving right over the holidays. Thank God for that, right? Uh, that doesn't hinge on that. It uh, doesn't hinge on those things. What it hinges on is Jesus. We often joke, you know, at, uh, if you've been around church for any length of time, that it seems like the answer to almost all the questions is Jesus. So if you're in a little uh, Sunday school class and you ask the kids, you know, 
for the answer, they know that maybe 90% of the time the right answer is Jesus. And you know, that's right. That's true. The right answer is Jesus. And apart from him, right, there is no hope. Apart from him, there is no meaning. Apart from him, there is no deliverance from the things that truly threaten you. Apart from him, right, we are reduced to a group of people uh, who are trying to have the deepest needs met with means and ends that won't do it. So Jesus is the answer, right? So I want to direct your attention. Come back to chapter 4 of the book of Romans, and you'll find in your bulletins that there's some notes there. I want to encourage you to have those notes as we work our way through. Wow, I like my flowery fall Greg Kowser up there. Uh, I didn't even notice it. Okay, so we're in the book of Romans, and we're talking about God's good news here. And this is important to talk about what God says is good news. And we often find out as we read the scripture that what God says is good news, people greet as bad news. So we're talking about God's good news, the creator God, and what he says is good. Now, uh, today we're going to just, my, my title for my sermon, I don't know if I beat Steve in terms of originality here or not, uh, for his last one, he had faith alone. His has a lot of historical cre credibility to it. Uh, mine is not. But I just want to suggest to you that what we have here is Paul, the whole chapter 4, is Paul taking a scriptural illustration to undergird the truths he's been talking about all along. Okay? So we're not, we haven't left really the passage that Steve had uh, the previous week. We're actually going to expand on that. And the reason I'm mentioning to that is one of the goals that we've had, um, uh, those of you, I'm, I'm glad as I look around, I see some notebooks because people are studying their way through the book of Romans and we're encouraging you to do that. One of the things that is, is behind us providing those notebooks is we want to make you as individuals better at reading your own Bibles. We want to encourage you to, to be people who don't depend just on the sermon, but you ought to come here, and if you've studied, you're coming here to get some insight on something that you've already looked at. You may have some questions you want to have answered. Sometimes uh, we as pastors hit those questions. Sometimes we miss them, uh, and then I get them in emails later on, right, which I'm happy to have. But we, we want you to engage with God's word on your own. We hope that you're coming with a little bit of work already done so that I can engage you on top of it. Now, if you haven't, that's okay. We'll take you in it. But, but if you come, right, with a little bit of a background already, you're already going to stand up and be anticipating things. And I hope that that's something that you'll do. So here we're in Romans chapter 4, and it's all focused on Abraham. Abraham, if you know the biblical story, right, was not... Uh, a very, uh, he comes on the scene in Genesis, uh, nothing really that we get much of a background except for his family, but he takes a central role in all of scripture. And Abraham, of course, is highly venerated within the Jewish world because he's so significant as one of the patriarchs, as they would be referred to, as Paul would refer to him himself. Uh, and we know that Paul is writing to a group of Jews and Gentiles in Rome. And he's going to illustrate saving faith, the kind of faith that transforms, the kind of faith that writes one with God. And he's going to use Abraham as an example to teach us about that faith. But he's also going to teach us about God's impartiality and God's consistency and all the different things that he's after here in the, in the book of that. But Abraham is going to be our case study today. Now, so far, as we've started the book, we started off in 1, 1 to 15, where Paul is telling who he is and what he's up to as he comes to the church at Rome, right? So these are important as we're reading the whole book, as you're reading Paul, when he lays out his opening salutation, it's often called his greetings, he's preparing the audience to read the book in a particular way. And so when you read it, you find out that he talks about the gospel, the good news that's centered in Jesus, but has its Old Testament roots, and that Paul has been appointed by God to go especially to the Gentiles, right? So in the Jewish world, in the, in, in the Jewish world, the way you describe the world is Jews and Gentiles. Well, Gentiles is everybody else, right? And there's a lot of variety among us Gentiles, but there's Jews and Gentiles. So when Paul's been appointed to the Gentiles, his appointment is a definitive proof that God wants this salvation to go to all people. How do we know? One way we know is he appointed Paul to go to all the rest of the people. So who is Paul? He's a Jew that's been appointed to go to Gentiles. 
So if you follow Paul around in his ministry, he's going to Gentiles all along the northern Mediterranean coast on his way to Spain. He probably doesn't make it to Spain. He winds up in prison and then is beheaded at the end of his life. But Paul is an apostle to the Gentiles. He sees his calling fulfilling something that the Old Testament anticipated as the Jews being those that would proclaim the good news to the Gentiles and the Gentiles would be gathered to the Messiah. So here's Paul in his position, but he needs to establish that because he's going to speak to Gentiles, but he's also going to speak to Jews in the city of Rome. Well, then we get to the theme in 1, 16 and 17, and this is where we're going to uh, come into the middle of our first one. And at 1, 16 and 17, these famous verses, which we'll read here in a moment, the just by faith shall live, the first eight chapters right, are going to deal with this idea, first one, the first four chapters is in how one is made just by faith, how one is righted with God by faith, and then chapters five through eight is this new life that we have by virtue of believing in Christ. So he's going to go after those issues in the first, but notice he's going to move on to defend his gospel, and then he's going to apply it. And We've uh, tried to argue here and make it clear that Paul's just not writing theology. He's not writing a book to everyone and no one at the same time. He has an audience in view, and in particular, he has a Jew and Gentile audience, and they're not getting along very well. And Paul's going to bring the whole weight of God's program in Christ to bear on Jew-Gentile dysfunction. Okay? So there's a lot to say here about the nature of the body of Christ and what it means to be brothers and sisters, and it anticipates that God is going to create a body of believers that isn't homogenous, that isn't a, a made up of a group of people who all look like each other or who all have the same socioeconomic level, or all have the same culture or ethnicity. Matter of fact, one of the things that sets apart and demonstrates the power of God is he takes people who are formerly enemies. He takes people who used to be at each other's throats. He takes people who don't have anything in common in terms of their culture or outlook on life, and he molds them together into one people, right? So this is just what Jesus said at the end of John 17, when he said, how will people know that you're my disciples? What did he say? By the way that you love one another, right? And that's not Jews loving Jews and Gentiles loving Gentiles or rich loving rich or poor loving poor. No, that's everybody loving each other under Jesus. Okay, key idea. And so he's going to explain it, he's going to defend it, and he's going to apply it. So here's our key verses. Would you read these with me, theme verses? For I am not ashamed of the gospel... Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Right? So those key verses, if you don't memorize any verses while you're working with us through this, you want to memorize those verses to remember the key thought in Romans. Now, once he's done with his theme statement, then we enter a, a major section that goes from 118 through chapter 8, okay? Now, 118 to 320, which is what we've just covered, uh, is the need, right? One of the things that happens here when, when you talk about God's going to save everyone, the uh, immediate question happens, right, especially today, is from what? <laughs> what? What do I need to be saved from? Uh, my wife, right, my boss, uh, the crazy politicians, right? Whatever. What do I need to be saved from? What is the threat here? Well, here he's talking about the threat of all threats, the wrath of God. Paul's going to celebrate when he gets to chapter 8 the, what God has done for us in Christ. And he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? But the, the opposite of that is also true. If God isn't for you, it doesn't make any difference who is. Okay? doesn't make any difference who is if God isn't for you. So the issue here is Paul is going to say it, the, the biggest threat, this is one thing to remember, the biggest threat in life isn't your boss, isn't financial, isn't sexual, isn't uh, the, the attitudes of the people in your family, it isn't what your neighbor is doing. The biggest threat to your life is your estrangement from God that's caused by your own pride and rebellion. That's the biggest threat. And so Paul says, who's going to deal with that threat? Who's going to take care of that? To have the God of the universe, the God who created you over against you, that is the biggest threat. 
So who can do that? So when Paul gets to chapter 8 and he celebrates what God has done in Christ, you're ready for a praise psalm by then. Right? You're ready to sing. You're ready to rejoice when you get to chapter 8. So the need is everyone is sinful and sinning. Right? We're broken because we are sinners. Right? It breaks our lives apart. It breaks our relationships apart. It, it disintegrates our identity and our personality. It destroys everything because we don't know who we are. We don't know who God is. We don't know how we're supposed to love our neighbor, what it means to be in a relationship with them. And so we're disordered. And so we pursue the wrong loves in the wrong order. So the need, everyone is sinful. Then the solution, right, that very important passage, 321 to 26, is Jesus is God's just provision for our sin, for every sinner, right? And the just provision here is that God had this dilemma from our perspective. How could God be just? How could he be just and justify right people who deserve judgment? How can you be just and do that? Right? Because God can't compromise his own character. And so God decided that the only way that could happen was for him to take it into himself. So Jesus came to bear what was rightfully ours so that God's just judgment for our sin could be meted out on Christ. And Paul makes it very clear. There's only two ways right, that you can, can relate to God's wrath. Either one, you can experience it for yourself directly or Jesus will experience it for you. You can experience it for yourself, or Jesus will experience it for you. So that's, the, that's what Jesus did. So he took what was rightfully ours with the heart of the Father. He stepped in. So the term is a propitiation. He satisfied God's just requirement for the penalty of our sins. Jesus did that. And then the righteousness that he earned, his righteous life, was put on our account. So we get to stand in the benefits of his life while also we get the benefits of his death. Right? Yet not I, but Christ, right, as we talk about here. So Christ is the way, and what do we do? We, we believe. And so when we come to chapter 3, verses 27 to 31, Steve's passage here, this means obviously if I'm so broken and I'm a sinful, sinning person, right, I can't fix myself, I can't write myself, I don't want to write myself. Ultimately, I don't want to bow the knee to God. I want my own way. I want to use God or neglect God. One of the things here I want to do. Well, here then, if indeed I can't save myself, if indeed God has to do for me what I can't do for myself, right, then there's no grounds for boasting. I can't stand before God and say, God, what a great catch I am for the kingdom, right? Or God's looking out here, you know, like a bad version of a, you know, a, a junior high pickup game, right? Uh, I'll take him. And I'll take her, and I'll take this one. No, and God's saying, too bad, you know, you stink over there, but these, these are great people. No, God looks over them, they're all worthless. God looks over them, they're all rough. Looks over them, they're all full of pride, and they think they can make it or on their own. And God says, I'll love them anyway. I'll love them anyway. And so anybody who comes to God, anybody who's a believer and has some sense of idea that, that I'm better than other people by virtue of the fact that God has rescued me, you don't understand what God did for you. You don't understand who you were. And sometimes this can afflict Christians who grow up within the church. Right, this, this old thing that many of you know, uh, as a father, I, you know, I, I've, I've been a Christian for a long time, and, and there's some people that really draw a crowd because their testimony is really dramatic. Right, they, they, they walked away from God, got involved in all kinds of things, got caught up in things, and when they tell about the grace of God, it's just a dramatic picture of God rescuing someone, right? Taking them out of the miry pit and putting them up on the side and making them a, a family member. It's dramatic, right? But I'll tell you as a father, I prayed and prayed and prayed that my daughters would not have that as their testimony. Right? I want them to come to know Christ and enjoy him for their life. But was it any less dramatic in terms of were they any better off? Were they people that deserved anything more than the person that was involved in the most egregious sin? The answer is no. No. And sometimes because we've been spared by God's grace from a life of tasting the dregs of sin, we take grace for granted. So the issue here is 
No place for boasting. And it said no to works, yes to faith, right? So if you can't boast, you certainly can't do anything. So persons that think you can, by virtue of your, your heritage or the privileges that you have or the, the moral achievements that you have, well, you think you can make it? No, 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 you've got you to believe. And belief is you're looking away from yourself and you're looking to the object of your faith, Jesus, to do something for you you can't do for yourself. So faith is empty hands, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Do for me what I can't do for myself. Lord, I turn from myself and everyone else. God, do for me what I can't do for myself. Right? So it's a statement of your helplessness and utter dependence. And so no to partiality and yes to impartiality. This is true for everyone. So God's not partial. He doesn't have a special way of salvation for Jews and a different one for Gentiles. No, all are equally sinful. All are equally turned from God and all must believe in Jesus Christ. And then no to contradiction, and this is where we're going to dig into this meaning, God's not inconsistent with his purposes. And so he's going to say, does this undermine the law, right, what I'd previously written in the Old Testament? No, it establishes it. And this is important for us, right? If you're, if you're a person that uh, is in a relationship with somebody who has broken their vows to their previous spouse, and they're telling you that I'll love you forever, you've got some grounds to wonder whether or not you can trust it. Can I trust that? I'm pretty sure you probably said that to your former wife. You probably said that to your former husband. And here we are, right here at the moment, and if you've got any wits about you, you should have a little, little, bit, a little bit of a, a yellow flag hanging around there. And the same thing, if God somehow is inconsistent with what he's already uh, had in his program, then wait a minute, can I really, when we get to chapter 8, can we sing a psalm of praise and celebrate that, in, that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ? You know, cross your fingers, you know, knock on wood, all right, whatever, right, because God dropped the ball in the past, so Paul is, 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 is giving us a little bit of this defense of God's consistency, that God is faithful to his promises, that he doesn't just change his mind, right? So the issue here is what we're going to get. Now, I want to show you here is, and this is to help us think about Paul's argument, because if you come to Romans chapter 4, and all of a sudden he talks about, well, look what Abraham found, okay? Now, what I want to suggest to you is that he's going to take every one of the statements at the end of chapter 3, and he's going to expand on each one of them. So no place for boasting. It starts off, Pastor Steve mentioned this, Abraham didn't boast, Okay? Then he's going to talk about no to works, yes to faith, and then Abraham is going to give a big amen to faith. And then no to partiality, yes to impartiality, and, he's, and Abraham's going to give an amen to God's impartiality. And then no to contradiction, yes to consistency, and then he's going to say amen to God's consistency. Right? So all we're doing is we're expanding on what was said at the end of chapter 3. Because we've come up through a long argument that has put everyone guilty before the bar of God's justice. We've also come up to the idea that there's only way to get out from underneath that justice is Jesus. And then it highlights the fact, well, how do you, how do you appropriate Jesus? How does Jesus come to your account? How do, you, how do you get for yourself what Jesus did? How do you get faith? Faith is what he wants to talk about. So we need to understand what it is. He's going to end in particular with that. So let's walk through some of these things here in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. So here's how he begins. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? What has he found? Right? So this is an exercise of going back and reading, in particular, Genesis 15. Uh, and this is interlocking with Genesis 15 and uh, Genesis 12, Genesis 17. But he's looking at uh, the story of Abraham and God's uh, engagement with Abraham and the covenant that he made with Abraham. He entered into a covenant of grace that he bestowed on Abraham, that he promised him that he would, through him, right, have many, many nations to come from his line. And that through his line, all the nations would be blessed. All the nations would be blessed. And in the background, the blessing isn't that they would have all lots of money 
that they would all be powerful and popular, that they would have great status. No, the blessing is in the biblical storyline, who's the line, who's the one through whom the ultimate blessing to restore the relationship with God that was hazarded, that was left, that was rebelled against in the garden. Who can bring blessing back to the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve? who are all outside the garden, who have lost the relationship with the God that they were created for, who has the God who stands over against them, who's going to open the gates of the garden again, right? That kind of blessing, eternal blessing. So Abraham, what shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter, if in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. Right? So Abraham is going to be an example here of someone who has nothing to boast before God because he was not righted with God by doing something, right? by earning it, by merit, by causing God to give him something by virtue of his inner moral qualities. No, he was justified by faith. He was made right with God by faith. Now, if you think about justified here, the term to be justified, it involves at least three aspects when you want to think about it. It involves kind of a negative idea, meaning that you're acquitted of the things that are over against you. So that's been removed, okay? The idea here is forgiveness, okay, forgiveness, right? Forgiveness, the idea of forgiveness is there's something that stands in between me and God, and that shapes the nature of his relationship toward me. Well, what stands in between me and God as an unbeliever is somebody who's rebelled against him. And God stands over against me because his love responds to my rebellion with wrath. So it stands over against me. Well, when I'm forgiven, that, that is removed. That is removed from between us and no longer shapes his relationship with me anymore. And now the positive aspect is I'm in a right relationship with him. I'm righted with him. So I'm acquitted, I'm forgiven, and I'm also in a right relationship with him. Now what Paul wants to make clear is for that to happen, for me to be forgiven, and for me to have that right relationship with him, is that Christ's work has to be appropriated to my account. So how on earth can that happen? How can he forgive me because God's just? He just can't wipe it off. And, and be inconsistent with his character. What happens is, is Christ is credited to my account. So I turn away from myself and say, God, do for me what I can't do for myself. And Christ's righteousness becomes mine. His right standing is what I get to enjoy. So I get to come into that status by virtue of what Christ has done. So this is what Abraham found in terms of how one is righted with God. Now, the next section here, he's going to say amen to faith. And so I've tried to do some things. I don't know if when you're studying, uh, I hope you, you can, you know, we've encouraged you, if you don't like to mark up your Bible, uh, some people don't like to do that, uh, I would prefer, right, that you just wear your Bible out, that your Bible is a working book, right? Now, some people, you know, I, I grew up in, in a little bit in the environment that you didn't write things in your Bible because it's God's Word, Right? Well, God's word is meant to penetrate your life and transform you, and I, I would just love to see it all written up. I've told you about my own dad's Bible uh, over the time. He wrote in it, wrote in it so much uh, that when he eventually got rid of his Bible and he had a new pristine copy, I, I thought, what in the world happened? So I went up to him and I said, Dad, well, what happened to your other Bible? Did you lose it or something like that? He said, no, uh, after a while I had so many notes in it, I was reading my notes instead of reading the Bible. And I said, okay, so, so I'm going to start it all over again, right? So the idea, but you ought to work in it. And if you don't want to, you can go to a place like BibleGateway.com. You can print it out on paper and mark it all up. Get markers out, get yourself a way to go out. But notice things that are repeated, right? And what you're going to find as you work through this is that Paul is going to go back to each one of those statements in chapter 3 and pick them up and expand on them, right? So it's the first one here. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now notice the emphasis on belief and trust are all the same term, right? Belief and trust are all the same term. Now to the one who works, here's the contrast. There's a fundamental contrast he wants to develop here. No to works, yes to faith. 
Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. Okay? Now, we've already found, right, that works would be useless because no one can earn a way with God. So if salvation was by works, it would mean that there was no one who can be saved. Why? Because we just read from 118 to 320 that all are, are all fall short, deliberately fall short of what God requires of them. There's none that seeks God. There's none that understands. So if it was by work, if it was by claiming God's uh, uh, favor by virtue of what you did, there would no, be no one saved. So it's not by works. And then, however, to the one who does not work but trusts God who justifies the ungodly. See, this is the crazy thing. God doesn't justify the good people. He justifies the ungodly people. And he justifies the ungodly. When you came to Christ, you were an ungodly man, an ungodly woman. And when you abandon yourself and cast yourself on his mercy, he applied to you what you didn't earn and what you didn't deserve. But in his mercy, he gave you what Christ had earned, what Christ deserved. You get to stand in it. So David, right, and he cites David from Psalm 32. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one whom God credits righteousness apart from. Okay, so notice here, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Notice he doesn't say, blessed are those who have earned God's righteousness. Blessed are the good people that God recognizes their goodness. What does he say? Blessed are those who whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Right? So no to works, yes to faith. Right? So David makes it clear what Abraham learned. Right? Now he goes on with an amen. Amen to God's impartiality. Right? So this is one of the things in the, in the place in which we live uh, in the culture in which we live, the kinds of things I'm saying right now are understood to be just incredibly bigoted and arrogant. That I would have the audacity to say that there is salvation in no other name given among men under heaven other than the name Jesus Christ. Okay? That is a term that is, is viewed to be just, that's just bigoted, hateful. Right? Now, God... Right? The whole biblical storyline centers on the resolution that God brings about to the human problem in Jesus. And I don't care whether you're reading your Old Testament or your New. What we find out all the way through is we need someone after Adam and Eve to reconnect us with God. Well, who can mediate for us? Because we're all under his wrath. We need someone to take the consequences for our sin. Who can do that? We can't bear the weight of that. We need someone, right, to stand in the gap for us before God and acquit us before his judgment. Who can do that? And if we don't have Jesus, Abraham is going to be our example because Abraham is ultimately going to be saved based on what Jesus does. Jesus fulfills everything that's required for us to be righted with God. And so the issue that we find here is that it applies to Jews and Gentiles, right? And for here, this means everyone. If it applies to Jews and Gentiles equally, it applies to everyone. So I don't care how old you are. I don't care what background you came from. I don't care how moral your life has been. I don't care how many people would speak up for you and tell me that you're a great person. I don't care how many, uh, if you've got even your own little Wikipedia page that lauds all of your achievements, right? We're talking here about what God requires. Everyone, right? I don't care how educated you are. So is this blessedness only for the circumcised? Does God have one way of salvation for the Jews and another one for the Gentiles, the uncircumcised? We've been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Now here, he wants to make a real point and Paul often does this, it's very important scripturally that you understand where you stand in the biblical storyline when you're understanding it for yourself. But it's also very important often to understand certain things happen before other things. 
And there's real implications here. Now he's going to, d- d- to develop the idea that Abraham was righted with God before he was circumcised. That's the key idea. He was righted with God before, right? He was circumcised. The circumcision said something about what had already happened. It didn't make something happen. Okay? Same way joy is, is uh, coming for baptism here in the near future. And when somebody goes up here and here into baptism, right, we try to make it as, as comfortable as possible unless somebody forgets to turn the heater on. Uh, then it's a little bit more challenging, right? But you come up here into the baptism, what happens to the person there? Well, if they didn't shower, they may be a little bit cleaner when they come out, but that's not true. Usually everybody who comes is all cleaned up and ready to go. It doesn't wash their sins away. It doesn't transform them by virtue of some inherent power. Nobody goes up there and blesses that water so that it becomes some sort of agent to spiritually transform someone. No, it's a picture of of what's already happened to them. And what happened to them? Well, they believed on Jesus and they turned their back on themselves and everything else. And Jesus allowed them to participate in the benefits of his death. So they're buried in the likeness of his death. And all the benefits of his death, him satisfying God's justice, are applied to them. But that happened when they believed on Jesus. That may have happened in their bedroom. It may have happened in a church service. It may have happened in the car while they were driving down the road. At one moment where they just said, God, I give up. God, I'm sorry. God, I repent. I've run away from you. God, do for me what what I can't do for myself. Save me, Jesus. Whenever you did that, that happened. And so we're just picturing the fact that that at that moment, all the benefits of Christ's death were applied to you. And also all the benefits of his resurrection come to you. So you've been made a new person with a new future, new meaning, new purpose, new life. Right? But that didn't do it. That's witnessing to what already happened. And that's exactly what he's saying about Abraham. Right? Under what circumstances was it credited? When when did he get righted with God? Right? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. It was before, right? And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So when a person goes into the bath, it's a seal, it's a sign of an indicator of what's already occurred. And that's why the mode of it, the way we do it, we try to indicate what it's a seal or a sign or a picture of. Right? So then he is the father of all who believe, right? He's the beginning of, a, a, of, a, of generations upon generations of believers. Right? Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had father. Thank God that he's got many sons and daughters. Right? So have not been circumcised in order that the righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So how is a person righted with God if you're a Jew? By faith in Jesus. If you're a Gentile, how are you righted with God? By faith in Jesus. Okay, so amen to God's impartiality. All right, now, the longest section is Dealing with God's consistency, right? How do we deal with the, the, the relationship between law and promise? Okay? And is it law versus promise? Or is it law and promise? Okay? Do they, do they fit together? And I want to show you here that if you're, if you're looking at what Paul does now, for the very first time in this passage, the word law, namas, occurs. So he says, okay, now let's talk about the law. Okay, so we've talked about faith versus works. We've talked about God's impartiality. Right now, we want to talk about God's consistency. Okay, so law versus promise or law and promise. Now, I want to say in terms of salvation, law does oppose promise in terms of how you right yourself with God or how one is righted with God. Because the law, to be used as a way to right yourself with God, is to misuse the law. That's never its intent. So it's really law and promise when you understand what the law was supposed to do and what the promise was supposed to do. They complement each other. They don't oppose each other. But when you get one wrong, 
you wind up using something that God meant for good really to your destruction. Okay? Now let me give you this idea. Hold, hold, flip over to chapter 10 with me for a moment. I know I'm, I'm going to peek forward a little bit. But here's where we're going to see the law misused, where Paul recognizes, right, the Jews have the law. Today, if you go to a synagogue, they'll call it the Hebrew Scriptures. They don't have a second half, if you will, of their Bibles. So the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, and as they read it, Paul would say this, and again, this is Paul who happens to be ethnically what? A Jew, right, speaking to his fellow Jews, okay? So here's what he says, verse 10, or chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer for God, to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Okay? So the key idea here, he's going to deal with the idea that the law is not the problem. The problem is the misuse of the law. The use of the law as if it's something that by virtue of its possession and by virtue of my attempts to try to obey its requirements, somehow that writes me with God. And what, what Paul's going to say is that that was never the law's intent. As a matter of fact, that misses out on the deep brokenness of every individual who's trying to obey the law. The law should have driven you away from it to grace. The law should have shut you up under sin and recognized that you're hopeless and helpless. And it should have pushed you away to say, God, this is too high for me. God, this is too hard for me. Uh, God, right? And turn you to say, God, I need your grace. So we're going to talk about this. So here's what he talks about. And I want you to notice here, the yellow is references to the promise. And then the gray shaded parts deal with the law. And so notice how all of a sudden law and promise come out. We have the statement of the promise and then references to the promise. So it was through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world. But through the righteousness that comes by faith, right? So we've already established that, that Abraham was saved by faith, not by works already. So the law in and of itself is not the problem. It's a wrong orientation to the problem. It's really a sinful orientation. Right? Th this is something you'll find right in, in America and in places where Christianity is there, is that people will hold on to a cobbled kind of Bible, has some key phrases in it, right? Some are not scriptural and some they attribute to scripture, right? Ones like, God helps those who help themselves, right? The truth will set you free, so what we need is more education because that will give you freedom, right? We've got a bunch of those. Uh, treat others as you wanted to be treated yourself, right? And so we've got all kinds of, it sounds like a religious veneer. It sounds like somebody who's really listening to God and maybe obeying God, but really hiding behind that is somebody who is using God and trying to say that, that I'm a moral person and I'm using those, but I'm not really submitting to the truth of God at all. I'm trying to establish my own righteousness through a scripture that should drive me away from any hope and help that I can provide for myself. So the issue here is even that one, right? The truth will make you free. I've heard that used so many times in contemporary political discussion. We need more truth, right? In an age of disinformation, the age of all those things. Well, in John, where that occurs, the truth that we all need is the truth about Jesus. It's understanding who he is and who you are, right? What's one of the most famous ones? If you're around Christianity at all, everybody knows John 3, 16. Here's the truth that will set you free. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him as the son of God, as the Messiah who came to deliver the world from its sins, whoever believes in him will not perish, but what? But have everlasting life. That's the truth that will set you free, right? That's the truth that will set you free. 
So here, he wants to point out, there's not an inconsistency between the true. When you see them within God's purposes and God's intent for them, right? The law should drive you to promise. The law should make you grateful for promise. And then the law also gives a picture of what the promise, when you believe in it, will make you to love these things. Make you a person to live this way. Because the promise of the new covenant as it comes, the one we celebrate when we take communion, is that God's going to take his righteous requirements and write them on our souls. So here's what he says. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing. And the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Right? The law will point out that we're broken. Right? Read back with me. Come back a little earlier. Chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know... That whatever the law says, verse 19, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. So the law, when we encountered it, should have driven us to our knees. To God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Instead, we try to take the law and manage our relationship with God. And so here, right, the law, what it does is it points out it makes sin, sin. Why do you mean it makes sin, sin? Well, you know, if I, have, if I had one of my daughters uh, and they're in the home uh, and we have a general principle, right, that you uh, don't run around on the furniture, okay? We tried to keep that happening, right? You don't run on the furniture. You don't stand on the furniture. Feet are for the floor. Any of you use that one? Right? Feet are for the floor, uh, especially feet that have shoes on them, right? So for the floor. I, I remember having a conversation at times about where your feet go, right? Uh, so feet are for the floor, uh, and you don't walk around on the couch. Now, if I've got a general rule in the house, and that's the way we operate, and I come in and I find my daughters all up on the couch, well, then I'm, I'm a little upset at them uh, because they know better. But if five minutes before that, I had looked at one of my daughters in the face and said, you know the rule, do not stand on the couch. What the law does is it makes that. God says, this is my character. This is my requirements. And then our disobedience becomes outright rebellion and transgression. And so the law stirs up our pride, it stirs up our rebellion, it stirs up our sinfulness, and we say, you know, talk to the hand, God. Right? So the issue here is the law, if it depended on law, right, it's all going to just reveal our darkness, our brokenness. It can't save us. And where there is no law, there's no transgression. Verse 16, therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. Not only to those who are of the law, the Jews who were gifted with the law and meant to be those that declared God's righteousness through their lives, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all, as is written, I have made you a father. Right, so here's the promise is that through him would be many who would follow in his train. And it was through him, by belief in the promise, that people would enter into the blessing of Abraham. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Right? This is a very important phrase here in, in this paragraph because it points to the idea that faith, as Pastor Steve was talking about, it's not my faith that saves me. It's the object of my faith that saves me. And who do we believe in? The God who brings the dead to life, right? Scripturally speaking, death is separation. When you physically die, your body is separated from your immaterial self, your soul. Okay? When you're spiritually deaf, you're dead, you're separated from who? God. Who brings the dead to to life God you believe on him who can take the dead and make them living God can 
And who knows the future? This final phrase here is the idea, some people think it, it may refer to the God who creates things out of nothing, like creation ex nihilo, creates things out of nothing. I don't think that's the, the preferred way to, to look at it. I think it's talking about, in terms of the promise, that God can speak of the future as if it's already occurred because he brings it about. So who do you trust you the future? Right? It's laughing, you know, about the politics. You had uh, a bunch of people who were predicting what was going to happen, right, in this last election, and they were all wrong, right? The, it was supposed to have some red wave, and it became a red prickle, right, or something, right? I don't know what it was, a red disaster, right? Whatever. So everybody was telling you that. Then immediately after that red disaster happened, people were immediately telling you what was going to happen next. All the same people that were wrong. Well... You, you weren't right on anything you said just before now. Now I'm going to trust you to tell me what's going to happen in the next four years? Uh, no. Right? Well, who do we, what's going to happen in the future? What's going to happen after death? What's the issue? What's in front of us? Who knows the future? One of the characteristics of God's glory, the thing that sets him off from every pseudo God, is that he knows the future because he brings it about. So that's the God we believe on. What am I trusting Jesus for today? I'm trusting him not only that he will keep his word to bring this dead soul to life, which he did by his grace, but I'm trusting him to fulfill the ultimate promise that one day going to return and right all things. And that gives me joy and purpose and endurance through the craziness of living in this world. Right? So I put my faith in him. Now, the latter part then, as he goes on against all hope, and this is where we get a picture of belief, what belief looks like, okay? Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations, right? He entered into and experienced the promise. He became the father of many nations. He became the one through whom God was going to bring blessing to the nations because he believed the promise, right? So now we, we're going to talk about this at the very end of the passage, we're not only people of the promise, we're the people who get to believe on the promise fulfilled in Jesus. Abraham believed that God would do this, but he didn't know how it was going to happen. He didn't know when it was going to happen. He didn't get experience in his lifetime. But he believed God. And just as we can trust God for our future, Abraham's whole life says that God's faithful. lose myself here God's faithful you can count on him right and this means two things right this has a double edge to it if you're running away from God and neglecting him God is faithful judgment is coming if you believe and trust in Jesus and experience God's wrath on your behalf blessing is yours now and forever you can count on it so without weakening his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. You know how old Abraham was, it tells us here, since he was about 100 years old, right? And you need to go back and read this story to be aware of it. Abraham, he wondered, you know, God, I don't know how you're going to do this, but I believe that you'll do it. Abraham, uh, Sarah just broke down in laughter, right? Like, oh, come on. This is craziness. God, I'm going to believe that promise. Right? And we're going to find out that even when God made the promise, it was another 20 years before the promise was realized. And in the meantime, Abraham started to waver. He believed in the promise, but he started to waver because he fell back into a kind of a mentality like, well, maybe I need to work it out on my own <laughs> since it doesn't seem like God's going to care. God said, no, no, you trust me. I'm faithful. I'll do it. Stop. Don't look to Eleazar. Don't look to Hagar. Don't look to these things. Trust me lesson for us. So without weakening his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead and that Sarah's womb was all, also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief, right? It doesn't mean that he was some super strong person that saved himself by virtue of the strength of his faith. He just said, God, I, I believe you're, you're true. I believe you're right because you're big enough and you're faithful enough and you're God enough to make it happen. So I just trust you. I don't know how it's going to happen, I don't know, what, I, it doesn't seem like it's uh, any way that I can figure it out, but God, I believe you. So I, I stopped trying to fix it myself. I stopped trying to work it out. I stopped trying to get good 
and get prepared. You know, I've sh shared this with you before of sharing the gospel with someone across the kitchen table. And sitting there talking with the person that said, uh, I, I invited them. I said, you know, today you can, you can change your relationship with Jesus today. You can know the blessing of being forgiven today. And she kept saying to me, um, I'm not ready yet. I got to get cleaned up a little bit. No, I got I to fix some things. I got some things I got to get fixed. And I looked at her with just brokenness. And I said, you know, that, that's the thing. Yourself. When you get to the point where you realize you can't fix yourself, you're ready to be fixed. You can't fix yourself. Right? That's the key thing. Way back in Jonathan Edwards' time, some of you remember him, right? 1700s. A, a thing that I remember about uh, Jonathan Edwards that I thought was so interesting when I read his biography is that he felt that the desperate need of his times was to write a popular treatment of original sin. He thought that the desperate need of his time was that they're essentially broken. And we live in a time where people think that I'm essentially okay and I need to coerce everybody else to tell me I'm okay. And the only people that really threaten me are the people who won't tell me what I want them to tell me about myself. That is the heart of the fall. That is the heart of human rebellion against God because our healing, our blessing, our hope begins when we let God in mercy tell us you're hopeless, bankrupt, and broken, but I can fix you. And they say, yes, I believe it. So he didn't waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith, gave glory to God, and being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. Right? So I don't know how you're going to do it, God, but you're the God. You're the God who brings the dead to life. You're the God who knows the future right from the beginning. You're the God. So I, I believe you. I believe you. I believe you. I'm not going to trust my own thinking. I'm not trying to fix it myself. God, do for me what I can't do for myself. I abandon myself to you. God, be merciful to me. And so this was, this is why it, his abandonment of himself, his casting himself on the mercy of God was credited to him as righteousness. All right, now, look, we're at the end of the passage, right? In the passage, 23 to 25. This is why the word it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but for also for us, right? And the us here is not just Paul's own readers, but everyone that's waiting on the return of Jesus. To whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins, right? Chapter 118 to chapter 320, who can deal with the sin problem? Jesus. Who can restore the relationship and was raised to life for our justification? Jesus. Abraham believed the promise. We know who the promise is. So Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 1, all the promises of God in Jesus are yes. Jesus is the answer, right? So here's four things. I'm not expecting you to write them. We'll go through here and then we'll conclude. Here's some ideas for us to take away. Believing allows the ungodly to have a right standing with God, something that would never happen if it was a matter of works. No one can earn a righteous standing by their heritage, their privileges, or their achievements. No one. Big idea. You can't fix yourself. Second, attempts to secure the promise by law-keeping, by works, only provoke God's wrath as we inevitably fall short of its requirements. All it does is cement our identity. Only a trust in the God who brings the dead to life and brings about the future can bring about our restoration and reclamation. You know, there's so many things, there's so many things. Uh, I love my wife. I love my wife. 
I mean this. I love my wife. But you know why I'm still married after all these years? It's Jesus. Am I the perfect husband? My wife can tell you no. Is my wife the perfect wife? Well, maybe 99%. But, I mean, we've had, our, we've had our disagreements. We've had our dark moments. We've had sinful behavior. We've had all those things. Why do we stick it out? Why do we hang it out? Because not, it's not the external pressure of what could happen to us by virtue of that because our culture doesn't care. Matter of fact, our culture assumes we won't make it. What drives me in that is I have a commitment to Jesus and I trust him that the best way to live is to stay connected to the woman that God gave me and to restrain myself and to see my future in terms of, of living with and for her. Why do I come to Emmanuel? Because everybody's perfect in here? Well, God knows that's not true because he looks at me. That's not true. Uh, have you been hurt? by? If you've been around here, have you been hurt by other people? Well, yes. Why do you continue to stay in touch with the people of God even though you're going to find hypocrites and broken people and people hiding things and facades and nuttiness going on and people trying to put on a good face in each other? Well, because we're already not yet people who are growing and moving on our way forward. Why do I continue to trust that this is the place that God says that you're going to be brought to life, that you need to picture the redemptive work that I'm accomplishing in my people, that something about your impact in the world is tied to being together with these pe people? The reason I'm here and the reason why I come every Sunday is that so I'm able and I miss it when I'm not here. Why? Because I am a pastor? No, it's because of Jesus. Seriously. Seriously, it's because of Jesus. When, when, I, when I was riding on the bus in Denver this week on the conference, and a 27-year-old young man, drug-addicted, homeless, Full of, full of all kind of bravado and empty pride and statements that were just denied on the face of his own life. Started asking him questions and talking with him. I started, because I was just a little of it, I was just trying to manage the relationship uh, to see, you know, what kind of person he was. And so I started asking him questions. And I said, where does God fit in your life? Oh, I'm, I'm, God and I are good because I've come to a, a position of spiritual enlightenment. Drugs help a lot with that. And I said, well, they produce some sort of enlightenment, I'm sure, right? And I just started asking him, I said, where, do you have family somewhere? Yeah, I have some. I said, have you ever tried to touch with them, get in touch with them? No. I said, do you think that they miss you? I said, I don't know. He, he, Jesus, Jesus is the answer. Not more benefits, not more drugs. He just broke my heart. Why? Because of Jesus. That's why I hurt for him. Can I fix him? No. I feel the frustration of it. Can Jesus? Yes. Why? Jesus. Jesus. Why do you keep reading your Bible when sometimes it's so frustrating? Because I've gotten your questions. Because I trust that it's worth my labors. Because Jesus is going to be revealed to me in it. Only a trust in God who brings dead to life. That's the only thing that can deliver you. Thirdly, faith does not save. It's the object of your faith that saves you. Right? If you're jumping out of a plane and you've got a parachute on, you may say, uh, the instructor's gone, jump, jump, it'll be the greatest experience of your life. Jump, jump. And you're looking out going, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Right? But your rest of your friends are up there going, come on, jump, 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 come on. You go, uh, right? Uh, and you, you go, uh, and the guy shoves you out the door. Right? And you have an automatic shoot, and it pops at the right time. Well, did your faith save you, or did your parachute save you? Well, the, the parachute saved you. Right? When you're standing there and you're going, God, I'm a mess. I, I'm screwed up. God, I know I don't have any claim on your favor and mercy. God, I know I've run from you. I've screwed up my life. Lord, I thought I could make it on my own. God, help me. God does for you what you can't do for yourself. Faith is an enablement from God to look away from yourself and all others to Jesus. This is why a recent book by John Piper, you know, if John Piper said it, it must be true. Uh, but a recent book by John Piper tried to define faith 
right? He talks about it as, as a treasuring trust. It's an interesting idea. I don't just come to Christ to get fire insurance. I don't just come to Christ because my life screwed up and somebody told me about God and then he'll fix it and make me healthy, wealthy, and wise. No. I come because I, a sinner has no better friend than Jesus. The cross draws me to Jesus. If you ever doubt the measure of God's love for you, sit at the cross. If you ever doubt his power to deliver you, go sit at the empty tomb. That's Jesus. Christ alone saves. That's the answer. We've been shut up to Jesus. The argument, Paul says, if you follow me along, it leaves you with Jesus. It leaves you with abandoning yourself and casting yourself on Jesus. That's where it takes you. I want to say to us as followers of Jesus, that's the same posture for every day. wisdom, creativity, perseverance, to put up with my relatives at Thanksgiving. I need Jesus, lots of Jesus, right, to do that. All right. Will you pray with me? I'm just going to bring us to an end here, David. Pray with me. Lord, I thank you for your grace to us. Thank you for loving us. Lord, I pray with Paul. Lord, we we struggle, even those of us who have known you sometimes for years, even decades. Sadly, Lord, we've known the experience that the familiarity sometimes has bred boredom, has bred a sense of uh, a lack of wonder, Lord, rather than an increasing awe, Lord, at your mercy to us in Christ. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here who know you. Lord, would you by your spirit open the eyes of our heart to be able to look at who we were, who you are, what you have done. And Lord, may it fill us with joy. May it tether our hearts closely to you, that we trust you without question, that we obey you without reticence. Uh, Lord, that we say no to sin because we love you. Lord, would you awaken in us a deep affection for you, as we see the display of your mercy and your provision for us, Lord, that you took care of what we had deserved and you took it into yourself and gave us what we didn't deserve through Jesus. Lord, I, I pray for anyone here today who doesn't know you, Lord, today here uh, listening online or here with us, Lord, I pray today, would you open their hearts to respond to the love of Jesus? Lord, could they put their arms down, could they stop running, stop trying to figure it out, Lord, and just fall before you and cry out to you to save them, to do for them what they can't do for themselves. Lord, I pray for us as a church, for us as individuals. Lord, would you help us, uh, Lord, to, to every day that we're trusting in the God who brings the dead to life and who knows the future. Lord, help us to not be overwhelmed by anxiety or fear. Help us, Lord, not to turn to our own devices to try to figure things out when it seems like you're too late or you're not doing exactly what we think. God, forgive us for, for uh, elevating ourselves in our own thinking, and may we trust you. And so, Lord, today as we leave, uh, Lord, help us to follow you. Thank you for all we have in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless you.